Well, good day, everyone, and welcome back to the Cyber Minutes podcast. Today, I'm joined by Flynn and our special guest, Ricky. So, Ricky, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit and um and tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, so, my name's Ricky. I work for a company called Talenza, um, a cyber security recruiter. Have been in the industry for about six or seven years, uh, recruiting in cyber, and eleven years in total uh, in tech. Yeah, awesome. What what was the what was the sort of switch to tech? A little ah, uh, sorry, switch to cyber security for you, Ricky. Cyber. Well, I, I probably did a similar background to a lot of people who work in cyber. So, I recruited infrastructure originally. So back when cloud was VMware yeah. uh, and Citrix, um, that was my speciality. So Windows, uh, Linux, VMware, Citrix were were kind of where I played. And um, uh, we had we had somebody work for our business who started up a cybersecurity desk and um, got ill and had to leave uh, quite quickly. And I kind of mentored somebody who was taking over that desk yeah. uh, and recruited some of the roles and they were just far more interesting. So the first role that I recruited was pen testing role, which yeah. um, uh, particularly then, you know, six or seven years ago, there was even less pen testers around. So it was particularly fun. Um, and LinkedIn was very different then. You couldn't send a message to somebody that you weren't connected with. So now you probably get bombarded with hundreds of LinkedIn messages a week. Back then you, you couldn't get any unless you connected. So you'd have to go through manually and connect with every yeah. single person. And I was just trying to find people that, I don't know, keyword pen testing or keyword OSCP or something and like connect, mass connect to all. And it would, oh, man. Anyway, it was far more interesting. And um, I wouldn't recruit in a different vertical now. I just, I enjoy it far more. Yeah. Um, it's probably the summary, to be honest. Awesome. So, one of the big reasons why we wanted to have a chat with you today is. Uh, we've done a couple of talks recently. So we had a talk uh, at the ACBI. Was it ABCI, Max? ACBI. ACBI, yep. yep. So the Australian College of Business Intelligence and one of the, about how to get into cyber, one of the big tips we gave to the students there was, you know, talk to recruiters. Um, there's a lot of fog around cybersecurity. You know, you go to the media and a lot of it's, oh, it's jobs galore. As soon as you get a degree, you know, you come out and you're, on 150 grand a year and your life set um but as we know in cybersecurity it's not quite uh, all sunshine and rainbows um so that's why we wanted to have you on today um what would you say is sort of what's the demand for cyber roles right now what's the biggest skill to have that'll get you a job in cybersecurity biggest skill to have so um this will sound like a cop out but probably the biggest skill that companies are looking for is actually experience within cybersecurity. Like there isn't some magic, um, study this, uh, and then you, there's an entry level role doing cybersecurity. Cause if you went back 10 years or something like that, cybersecurity wasn't an entry level role. It was something that people transitioned into from somewhere else. And I don't think that it's any different now, except there's an expectation perhaps for people who are graduating from university or, or you know, these hundreds of courses that have popped up in the space yeah. Um, with almost an expectation that you finish the course and then you can go straight into a job. There's um, there's a real shortage of, of jobs that suit very early career people. And um, I mean, where recruitment as an industry um, uh, probably exists more to cater the more experienced um, requirements within market. Like if I've been in, in the industry for... Uh, let's say 11 years across all of IT, yep. I've probably recruited three or four entry-level roles ever, and that was normal IT and cybersecurity combined. So it's very rare. Um, now, in terms of skills that are in in demand, I think um, uh, we've seen a lot of demand for people with skills in governance, risk, and compliance, um, very much being driven by a number of um, legislative changes and also some by the financial services um, regulators, which are really driving an uplift. Um, that's probably where we've seen a big demand and, and incident response, um, more from a technical perspective within a SOC. Um, 
because there's the non-technical incident response, which it's also exists in market, but um, you know, probably seeing more of a demand for the technical incident response. And I also think that's probably driven by legislation, to be honest, as well. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. It's an interesting one because you know, there's a lot of people that think that cybersecurity is all coding, it's all uh, all you know, hacking and stuff. When it's it's really not the case. And yeah, I've I've definitely seen it that. There's a bit of a push now to look into governance risk compliance with CPS 230, you know, not too far away. That's a sort of a big regulatory shakeup that's going to require a lot of attention, a lot of effort um, from companies moving, you know, from this point onwards, pretty much. So it makes sense that a lot of a lot of companies are recruiting for uh, for people in that sort of area. Do you need to be able to code to get into cybersecurity these days? Like, what's no, the what's the stick? Definitely not. I think it helps. Um, even uh, even say an engineering role, which a few years ago you wouldn't have needed any coding ability. Well, um, now they want to automate more and more tasks. So yeah. being able to at least script within within Python is a huge advantage. But it's definitely not a hard and fast requirement. Yeah. Uh, and there's lots of engineers that that aren't strong in that at all. I don't know if um, uh, I don't know if Chat GPT and those types of tools will actually make make that skill even less of a demand like because i'm sure that you could be like hey i have this version of this cisco router and i want to automate this task that i do can you write me a python script that i can run in this version it would probably do a passable job most of the time so yeah. maybe maybe it's less um in the immediate term but i'd say very rare that i get asked um when i'm recruiting for a role that hey can you can you screen them really hard for for coding abilities is always just like a cherry on top, I'd say. Yeah. Right. Yeah, um, so, uh, sorry. It's, that's a bit of a, a thing that I've seen where if these days, if you've got an understanding of computer science and, you know, a very basic level of, okay, I can code some Java or code some C or Python, then AI and ChatGPT really make it so that you can sort of level the ground, which you're able to code on so if you know kind of the concepts in java and python you can translate it really well into into different coding languages and if you know what you're trying to explain to the to the you know ai then it's going to be able to do most of the hard work into translating that into something else but yeah i think that's a really good point yeah i would i would even add to that that although i would say coding is definitely harder you you know being able to utilize chat gpt and ai in general to sort of do those sort of tasks as a skill in itself would you say that you know you see some kinds of emerging skills that sort of give people an edge kind of like that that might it might be a bit too early for stuff with ai but would you say yeah. even in the past five years there's certain things that pop up like obviously regulatory changes are a big aspect of it but it's funny because this goes against what i said just now but i'd probably say the skill um which helps people is being able to code now it isn't a hard and fast requirement but even uh, a role as an analyst where you're looking at an endless amount of queue um you know tickets coming through with um with potential issues if you're able to script and you can you know you can write something that automates this alert as being a false positive or whatever you're inherently more valuable than somebody that can't do that yeah maybe five years ago there was less of a demand for that um, which is funny because I've almost contradicted what I said there. Um, but that's probably the biggest thing in the last five years. I think surely there'll be people that become very savvy with using ChatGPT or similar, or well, the AI tools in general over the next little period, but there'll still be that need for being able to understand and contextualize what it gives you to know if it's right or wrong. Yeah. Um, I'd say it, it Max, hit the nail on the head. Yeah, Max hit the nail on the head with the foundational sort of knowledge. Um, if you got the building blocks there, you're good to go. I think. Mm. Yeah, and and I say I suppose it depends on the role, right? Um, yeah. Like some of the technical roles, coding's way more valuable mm. than others. Um, and so I mean, if you're going for a job in GRC, being able to write code isn't going to be very valuable. Um, yeah. But if you're a pen tester and you knew how to read and write code in multiple languages, well, yeah, that's going to be very valuable. Yeah. So. Um, there's probably not a one one that suits all um, role families, but I guess the thing that I would say is that any more skills yep. 
uh, is never going to be seen as a negative, like having breadth of skills and a depth, obviously, in a couple um, would be more of an advantage than not. Yeah, no, 100%. Are there any certs that you reckon are, are good for sort of beefing yourself up a little bit? Or on the inverse, do you think there are some that are that are actually just useless, like they don't do anything for you? Oh, there's uh, there's definitely um, CH is on the no value level. Uh, there's thousands of memes about it that we don't, yeah. the, don't need to get into a mudslinger match. But um, if it's specifically for somebody trying to get into security, I think yeah. um, CompTIA's Security Plus and Networking Plus are like a really good starting point yeah. because they just give you a good baseline knowledge. And then depending on the type of role that you're going for, obviously there's certificates that are aligned to it. I think um, particularly for um, any of the analyst or um, incident response certs, anything by SANS yep. are like gold standard and for yep. pen testing, particularly in Australia, um, any of the offensive security certifications are very high regarded. Um, outside of that, I mean, it depends, depends on the vertical, right? Like yeah. Yeah. Um, de- generally for more engineering focused roles, the vendor certifications give you a really good pathway um, for people who are I know that there's one that, that caters to GRC people in the kind of early stages of their career, like CISP is obviously well regarded for yeah. giving you um, inch deep, mile wide knowledge, but there's experience levels that you need to hit for that. Maybe the, um, uh, what are they, they've just changed their name, um, ISC2 as opposed to ISC squared. They've got a, a foundational course, which I think is pretty good as well. Uh, and it's a re- is this the CC? I don't know what that what the the code for it is. I should have researched that before the um. <laughs> yeah, there are, okay. yeah they, they've got a few there. I actually didn't know they changed their name to what is it ISC two now. Two. Yeah, they don't call themselves squared because uh, that uh, that translation doesn't doesn't work across all languages. But saying ISC two does yeah. more or less. Yeah, I haven't seen too many GRC uh, sort of certifications because you know, I'm in typically GRC myself and I don't have a cert to my name. I've got a bachelor's degree, but, you know, in terms of certs, I basically don't have anything and don't particularly plan on getting anything anytime soon. I think I'm at that point where I can just kind of look at the experience level. Um, something, it's a bit of a broad question and a difficult one. So when Max would give Max and I were giving this talk, we said, that a big important thing about getting into cyber is recognizing how multidisciplinary the field is. As we said, you can be a coding expert and you can be in cybersecurity and you cannot know a single line of code and be in cybersecurity. Um, If someone was to start from square one, what kind of roadmap would you give them to try and get into cybersecurity? Well, I'd I'd probably say uh, go to some of the free events that are around firstly as a starting point. So um, Sec Talks is a great one in Sydney, runs once a month. Um, there tends to be a meetup focused on various different things as a cloud security meetup in Sydney. Uh, there's Acer run their monthly meetups, Asaka run meetups just about every other month. Um, and you could, the reason I'd say to go to those is you, cybersecurity is such a broad um, sector that you, if you've never worked in it or you've never done much research about it, how are you going to know which path to kind of pursue? Yeah. So if you go to a few events and get a feeling for what some of the people are talking about, it might be super technical, but a lot of the time they're not. They're very approachable talks. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can get a feel for the stuff that you find interesting. And then I do as much self-research as I possibly could about that subject. Um, you'll probably find that there's a number of free resources that can teach you the basics of any of those technologies um, and then get interested. And yeah. I think cybersecurity is one of those areas where even once you're working in it, like it's not a nine to five job, right? You don't clock off and then not do not do stuff that's to do with your work. So um, if you think that you're going to get into, this sounds really strong, uh, it's perhaps unrealistic to think that you can break into an industry where everybody's working more than nine to five yeah. without doing any extra study during the night. You can't just go, I want to be a pen tester and then get a job as a pen tester when funnily enough, you've got to do 
thousands of hours maybe of of work to get to the point where you can be employed as a pen tester. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where there's maybe a bit of a mismatch. It's not like, it's not it's not a job that's like one where you can just easily walk into it like getting a job as a laborer or something like that where you actually don't need any any skill except to be there. You, you kind of need to have honed some, some craft work to to get a start even, um, which is hard. And, and perhaps people who are on the outside seeing this sexy topic of cybersecurity, um, maybe it's hard to accept that that's the fact, but the people who are in the industry have done the same thing. Like everybody's crafted and, and, and grafted away for hours and hours to get to where they are. So you can't just rock up and expect that you're going to get let in because you want to be. Mm. Again, that sounds, that probably doesn't translate well on a podcast, but there's probably some th- of the hard truths about it. I think it's completely true. It's just the nature of the field as well. You know, with tech and, you know, hackers, they're always going to be ahead of the game. If someone's going to be working, you know, day and night trying to get into your system, how are you going to expect to defend one if you aren't doing the same thing? Um, yeah. it, it is. It does sound bad a lot of the times, but I do agree that it's such an upskilling game, cybersecurity, um, and being able to, you know, balance um, upskilling yourself is such a valuable thing to do. Yeah, and I've got a uh, client, right? Sorry, sorry to, to cut you off, Max. I've got a client who's a SISO, right? So he's head of security for. If they aren't ASX hundred, they must be close to it. Yep, ASX one hundred and fifty, let's say, um, about eight hundred staff. The guy works seventy to eighty hours every week. Like wow, and, and he's the SISO, right? He's not in a job, and he is not he's not in an entry level job. But if if he's at the head of the food chain. And you're thinking that you're going to work 40 hours a week and get closer to where he is by doing 50% less hours almost. Like, yeah. it, it's not realistic. No. Um, and I think you'd probably find that a lot of people who work in cybersecurity, I mean, I don't know about you guys, I recruit in cybersecurity. I do, uh, I probably do 10 hour days, five days a week, you know. And if I didn't have kids, I'd probably work more hard. <laughs> get at it. Yeah, I mean, really, you guys do more than. 40 hours right i mean well look at us here even though podcasting isn't technically like work i would say you know we do um you know our typical nine to five well it's not really nine to five but you know what i mean and then you know we're doing the podcast and i am slowly trying to upskill my technical ability as well which you know is here or there some days i miss it some days i don't um but yeah it's a it's a difficult thing to do and um it's an it's an unfortunate hard truth i think about cybersecurity. Yeah, and something that I've not even, I haven't really intentionally done, but it's something that I've realized all my previous jobs, if they were casual or part-time or whatever, they don't really creep into my personal life. But cybersecurity, you know, I would only realize what I'm doing and I'll be looking through cybersecurity articles for an hour and a half, two hours, just, you know, before I'm going to bed or learning and reading stuff online or watching YouTube videos. And I go, huh, I've been, you know, just learning stuff for the last two hours. It's just soaked into my brain. And it's something that I suppose if you want to break in the industry, you have to have that kind of passion about it for, to learn more about it. Uh, otherwise, you know, people who are going to be learning fresh new stuff every single day, they're going to have such an edge over you. It's, it's not even going to be like a competition, really. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. So another sort of one we had for you, Ricky, was... What are some common mistakes that you see in resumes, interviews, or any of sort of the process of touching base with employers? What are some of the things you see that, you know, make you cringe a little bit like, ah, you know, that's not the right way to go about it at all. And what are some things that our listeners could potentially just some easy pieces to... Easy ones. Yeah. Easy ones, right. And so imagine, put yourself in the shoes of the person reviewing your resume, right? Um... I spend, let's say, half my time reviewing resumes. So let's say we'll call it four days, uh, sorry, four hours a day, let's say. Yeah. Um, in that time, um, I might review hundreds of resumes. Now, the first cull for those resumes is the ones that don't meet, like aren't pleasant to the eye or something about them looks off. So what do I mean by that? You don't need 15 different types of font on your resume. One, t- one style of font is okay. And you can have different sizes for headings and so forth, but it doesn't need to be all over the shop for that. Like that's probably the easiest thing. Um, uh, people leave 
it's the analogy that I use. Like, um, you know, Hansel and Gretel, the, the nursery rhyme or whatever it is, they, yeah. they talk about leaving the trail of crumbs, right. To, to get back to the house or whatever the, 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 the fable talks to same thing with your resume. Like, don't think that you can just leave a trail of clues to lead somebody towards why they should call you. Yeah. Like be really obvious about it. Um, I've had five years experience in an IT help desk. I've learned the basics of networking and windows and Linux. And I'm really interested in moving into cybersecurity to do this. Yep. Like make it obvious. Don't just be like, here's my CV. Please call me. Yeah. Like, um, uh, and I think like tell a story about why you're wanting to get into it. Like I got interested in cybersecurity because my mum's computer got hacked and she lost $500 to some a dodgy hacker from around the globe or something like that. Because if I was reading that, I'd be like, oh, that's interesting. That's a reason to call that person. Yeah. yeah. Um, or like uh, lists, if you've done a course, right, and part of that course was you had to build a home lab, talk to that. I did a course and I had to build a home lab. I used this version of, um, I don't know, put Ubuntu on a on a box in, inside a VM and I put this on it and I tested this. Like talk mm -hmm. to that. Because if you don't have the experience, how am I to know why I should call you? So yeah. put all of the stuff that you've done that's related to cybersecurity on there. Um, list, uh, people get in this habit with their resume of listing the responsibilities of their role. Like, I don't know, uh, I was going to swear then, I don't know how cool that is on a podcast, but like, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine, we'll bleep it. <laughs> like, I don't care if, you, if, you, if you've... Um, if you take phone calls all day on the IT support desk, tell me about some of the stuff that you've actually done, which is cool. Like I, uh, I sit on the help desk and I resolve the complex tickets. Here's an example of one of those, you know, like talk to some of the technical specifics, not just explain what your job is. Like yep. that's probably the really, really simple one. Talk about results, not just what your responsibilities are. Um, that's on a resume. Look in interviews. Um, I think it's probably much of the same, like talk about, you can do lots of things to, to train yeah. yourself for interviews. Nobody likes doing them. Like everybody's uncomfortable. So as soon as you accept that everybody's uncomfortable in an interview, like if you're nervous, tell the person interview and you'd be like, oh, I'm really nervous. I haven't done an interview like this for a while. And then you know what? It's out of your head. And then you're not trying to pretend that you're not nervous. Um, but you can practice your interview techniques, like film yourself on, on, um, Microsoft Teams or something mm. and watch yourself back or film yourself being interviewed and then get your friend to watch it and ask them, how did that look? You know, think about the types of questions that they're going to ask you and, and don't script your response necessarily, but they're going to ask you like, why, why are you interested in working for our company? Yep. Like maybe you should look them up before you go for the interview. Yep. You know, um, if I, if I ever have somebody interviewing for a client, I give them like a cheat sheet. Right. So here's the job spec. Here's my briefing notes about the role. If I've known the interviewer for some time, I'll give them as much info as I can. Expect some questions like this. You're going for a pen testing job. They're going to ask you about a, a web app that you tested recently. Yeah. They're going to ask you things like this, you know, um, and it's quite funny. I actually, I started putting those preparation guys together because, uh, I, I read an article that a recruiter that worked at Google wrote. And this was an internal recruiter who worked for Google, who would send this massive list of preparation documents to people to interview for jobs at Google. Yeah, and I'm like, <laughs> what? Uh, and I, here I am recruiting for other companies, but I don't do anywhere near that level of detail. I'm like, well, I've got to up my game so that these people can do better at the interviews. Um, uh, I'd ask for advice is, is probably the one other thing. Mm. If you're going for a job through a recruiter, ask him, yep. what are they going to ask me? Oh, I don't know. Well, can you find out so that I can prepare? Oh, yeah, I'll find out. And then that person can send an email and be like, hey, what should I have him prepare around or her prepare around? You know, and then you can go into the interview probably a little bit better prepared. Yeah. Um, depending on the company, you could honestly write into Google and be like, uh, hey, Google, I'm interviewing at... Uh, I don't know, pick a big tech company. Yeah. What are some of the questions they're going to ask me? Bang. It'll spit out 50 questions that you might get asked 
or ask an AI, um, hey, I'm interviewing as a security analyst, what's some of the things that I could prepare around? It'll give you 50 things, but um, I think don't, don't assume, don't assume too much. Um, you know, be, be inquisitive in those interviews, ask questions. Probably, actually, one other thing that's really worth highlighting is don't ever get to the end of an interview and not have questions that you have for them. Yeah. Yeah. Because they want, they want to know that you're interested in their yeah. company. Yeah. And it could be something as simple as, what do you expect from me in my first month on the job? Mm -hmm. Like really, really, a really simple question. You could ask that in every interview yeah. and they'd be like, oh, wow, well, he seems really interested in us. Um, well, what does a, what does a normal week look like? You know, um, those types of things are just really basic questions that you could ask in any interview that would, would have you seem, um, that more engaged with the company. Yeah. Right. One of the things that I sort of, you know, use a little bit and that I sort of related with what you said as well is make sure that you're preparing yourself a little bit mentally. So for me, it meant a little bit more like thinking of creative questions they might ask me and think of some creative responses that not only are just like throwaways, but are also insightful to what you know about cybersecurity or the industry or the company that you're going to work for. Like, yeah, really researching the company and knowing what kind of responses that you're going to want to give them as opposed to, to say, for example, if you were applying for a, like a finance company uh, or maybe like a, a school company, a school versus a life insurance company, obviously your responses are going to want to be a bit more empathetic towards the life insurance company because that's the kind of the work that they do is it's more empathy and more relating to people that those kind of those kind of yeah responses yeah, i think um anytime there's that whole that whole analogy the four p's right mm. um uh prior proper planning prevents poor performance maybe that's five and i think you can have Close six. enough <laughs> yeah yeah you can have six as well if you put more p words in there but um uh, what do they say? Um, if you if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail, right? Yeah. yeah. So spend 20 minutes thinking about the company, think about what you think they're going to ask you, and then think about how you'd answer it. So behavioral questions, you're always going to get asked like, and they're very much for, uh, in case there's people who are listening who have not um, been for many interviews, it'll be questions where they give you a scenario. And they'll be like, how do you think you would react if this happened, right? Like, how do you think you would react if you were uh, working as a security analyst for our company and you had two seemingly um, P1 incidents come through at the same time? How do you think you would react, right? And as, as a person who's never interviewed before, you might think of a theoretical answer for, well, I guess I would react like this. And it's like, actually, just tell them, hey, you've done that before, like, well, I have that happen every day because I'm an analyst in an, an managed service provider and we get smashed. We get 600 tickets a day and every one of them looks super urgent. So I would I would, uh, I would look at the two tickets and I'd, base, I'd do a quick analysis on what I thought might be more of a, an issue based on that. And I'd grab my mate who's next door that doesn't have a ticket right that second, pass all of them off to him, and then we'd deep dive on them separately, whatever it was, right? And then you're, you're answering a theoretical with how you've resolved it in the past. And straight away, as soon as you aren't thinking about a theory-based answer, you can answer it really easy because you've done something similar. And if I'm the interviewer, I'd be like, oh, that person's way better, you know, because they've done it. One thing I'll ask quickly is because Max, Max and I have touched on it before. Um, how important do you think the soft skills are in cybersecurity you know the you know being able to communicate to people report writing to an extent you know max and i've used the analogy of you could be the most brilliant person in the world but you know if you can't explain what the problem is to someone is there really much point um mm. how important do you think the soft skills really are far, far more than people probably give it credit for um i think report writing is valuable in pretty much every role like um say you want to be a pen tester, guess what? 50% of your job's writing a report, mate. So if you can't contextualize the risk that you've found into a way where they're going to care, um, you're probably not going to have all that long of a career doing it. Yeah. Um, uh, there's this, there's this saying in industry for like, nobody likes the brilliant jerk. Like, yeah, you might be the most technically brilliant person, but if you're an asshole, that company's not going to hire you. 
So that whole analogy, I think rings true across the whole of the industry, yeah. um, and soft skills, whether that be report writing or, um, uh, or even the, in the interaction, like cybersecurity people, a lot of the time you might have to be delivering a message that the company or the person, they might not want to hear. So if you can't like develop your bedside manner a little bit, um, to the point where you can deliver some, some kind of bad news in a soft way. Um, again, it, it may not go as well for you. Yeah. And if, um, one of my kids is really into cricket, so we'll use an analogy for cricket. My son's like, oh, I, um, I don't like batting. He loves bowling. Don't like batting. And I'm like, well, mate, you know, just think about the best bowlers in the world that exist. If it came down to it and two of them were going for the same position, and one of them could bat better than the other, and their bowling was about the same, they're going to pick the one with the rounded skill set. So I think you could use that same analogy uh, when, you, when you're looking at a job in cybersecurity. It's like, hey, if you don't have that rounded skill set, somebody else might tip you just because of that. You might be way better than them technically, mm. but they might have some softer skill that pips you, and it's like, well, you should just develop those skills as well as much as you can um, so that you're you know, a lot more employable, I guess. Yeah. 100%. And, you know, those come with uh, what we've already said, you know, going to the events and stuff like that, learning to communicate with people, networking. you know, talking to people in day-to-day -day life and networking. It's just yeah. easy way to do it. Yeah. Well, and, and something that, um, that I, I tell this story to a few people and that they, they find it very, what's the word I'd use? Interesting is maybe not the right word, but, um, like I'm really shy as a person. Like it's funny cause I do a sales job, recruitment's a sales job, right? So, um, but when I was a kid, I used to go to, go to family events and hide behind my mum's legs. And I was always the shy kid. And, um, uh, I've kind of developed coping mechanisms for that. And like, if I go to an event and there's more than about six people, I'm pretty uncomfortable too. But I know that for me to get the result that I want out of these networking events is I've got to do stuff that's uncomfortable. So, um, like I've presented at conferences and things like that. It's terribly uncomfortable for me. And like my heart's pounding out of my chest but it's like it's okay to do stuff that you're that you're scared of and the first um the first meetups that i went to i didn't talk to a soul you know so i think the move up the the way i'd think of it with those events is everybody there's probably a little bit uncomfortable for one yeah but if you went to an event and you spoke to five people right and then you did that at the next event and say so you did it for a year all of a sudden you now know 50 people in the industry you know, you compound that over a few years, you know, there's, there's not that many people in cyber for one, but if you're trying to get a job and you go to those events and you're seen and you say hi and you're friendly to people and you articulate why you're trying to get into the industry, you're probably more likely to find a role yep. that way. You're certainly giving yourself a better chance of finding a role than if you don't do that. Um, and those events are free. You generally will get pizza and a couple of beers if that's what you're into. Um, so like the, there's not really a massive loss, um, for going to those events, except for two hours out of your week yeah. uh, or your month, depending on how often you plan on going to them. I myself, I live two hours away from the city. So if I go to one of those events, I often, I get on the train at about six in the morning to get into the city and then I'll work a whole day and then I'll go to those events. And then like I went to one last week, I got home at half past 12 at night. So I'd, I left my house at, uh, 6am. And I got home at half past 12 the next day. And then I had to get up and leave at 6 a.m. the next morning. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that hits home for me a lot. And I'm about the same, about two hours away from the city. So yeah. <laughs> whenever I do the exact same thing. Um, yeah, it hurts, but it's, you know what? It adds up. Like, like you're saying, 100%. Yeah. Hmm. It adds up and, you know, you get more comfortable. That's the thing as well. If it's five people, you're talking to the first one, you know, you can try and go for six. And you, usually you'll find that, over time, it gets less and less and less nerve wracking. And then you're just used to it yeah. after a year. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Ricky. Have you got any final sort of tidbits of information to, to give anyone listening? I'd say um, probably lean back into some of the stuff that you said earlier. I guess um, for anybody that's listening wants advice or insights, like ask people in the industry. Yeah. Like people are helpful if you ask them. Um, I'd, I'd say be specific though. Like don't just be like, 
how do we get into the industry? Like be like, Hey, I want to get a job as a security analyst and I've done this sort of stuff. I just need a little bit of help on how to get through the next goalposts or whatever that is. Yep. Um, yeah. And you'll find everybody wants to help in the industry. It's got this great community feel. Um, but, um, I think, you know, I, I could speak to, to many senior people and everybody wants to solve the same problem, which is the, the, the lack of, um, I guess the lack of kind of mid to senior talent, everybody wants to solve that in the industry. So if everybody who's trying to break into the industry reaches out to lots of people to try to get in, funnily enough, there'll probably be more roles get created from it. So I'd kind of like make your own luck, if you will. Yeah. Um, uh, if anybody listening wants to, to reach out to me, happy to have a conversation. We've got documents we can send on um, how to break into the industry on almost like a boilerplate template for resumes that people can use, like happy to share all of those types of things. Um, but yeah, I think that'd be it. Like go to events, say hi to people and, and, um, and try to find your own role. It sounds weird, but if you apply, um, uh, in fact, one of the things that I think I mentioned to you guys the other day when we are preparing for this call, um, yeah. I ran a poll on LinkedIn the other week and had more than a hundred responses. So if anybody studied marketing less than a hundred, is not a quantifiable amount, more than a hundred uh, respondents here. So had more than a hundred people that came back and the question was, how did you get your first job in the industry? Right. And it was, it was something like 70% of people was either through networking or like referral. Yeah. Uh, and then it was say 12 or 13% maybe from a recruiter and like 17% from seek or a similar job board. So that's more than two thirds of all of the jobs that people get as their first role in cyber didn't come from applying to a job on seek, um, or through a recruiter. So that means if you aren't networking and networking doesn't just mean going to events, it mean, could mean networking within your own company, or it could be like, um, uh, being at a barbecue with, with your friends and talking about how you're trying to get it. That could be networking as well. Um, and you're probably far more likely to find a role or statistically you are yeah. based on, um, on that poll. Um, than you will be from applying just on seek. So if you're only doing that, you're missing a lot of opportunities would be the, uh, probably the, the, the thing I would say. Yeah. I must admit that I'd actually did steal the results from that poll to put in our presentation because I thought it was, uh, it perfectly, um, encapsulated what we were trying to say with the networking aspect. So I uh, couldn't agree more. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Ricky. We'll catch you around. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thanks for listening. Just a reminder that the Cyber Minutes podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by hosts and guests are their own, not necessarily their employers. Advice discussed is general advice. We promote ethical discussions, not illegal activities. Have a cybersecurity question? Send an email to cyberminutespodcast at gmail.com as we'd love to answer it. Stay cyber safe.